I'm going to say just a quick prayer. Uh, I haven't ended with prayer. I'm going to start with prayer because it's, it's a little scary to be back. And I'm not a business guy. I'm not an entrepreneur. But I'll tell you my story in a minute. I have the gift of disorientation. So if I start to go astray, I wind up in places I never planned to go because of that. So bear with me. Creator God, we do need help. Uh, we all need to figure out how to follow Jesus. In a world <clears throat> where there's so much suffering, so much need, and help us, dear God, not only to discover the potential of social entrepreneurship, <clears throat> but the possibility in our lives and churches to find some innovation too, to find new ways to be more serious followers of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, like I said, I <clears throat> grew up in San Francisco, um, had the run of the streets as a six, seven, eight-year-old, which you couldn't do in a small town in any place in the valley these days. Uh, my dad was a shipyard worker, um, wasn't raised in a church family. I hung out with a group of aspiring delinquents in high school, went down the peninsula, went to high school in San Mateo, uh, and as it turned out, we weren't even any good at delinquency, you know, things just didn't work well, <laughs> Could, couldn't get it. Do you, do you know the, the ancient film from the Valley, American Graffiti, have you seen that? If you haven't, you need to. Uh, that's the culture I was a part of uh, in those days. I was, wasn't raised in the church, but I got converted late in high school and decided my, because I was hanging out with this group, my grades were in the toilet. I couldn't do, you know, but God can use most anything. So I went on to college, been an urban social worker in San Jose in other days, uh, headed up a project in Haiti where I'd lived two months out of the year for seven years. So I've always been interested in change making, but I went to a conference in San Francisco in 2013 called SOCAP Conference. Have you heard of this? Uh, Fort Warden. Uh, a Christian couple, she's an Episcopal minister, her husband's Christian, uh, they started this 10 years ago, and it's a conference on social entrepreneurship. And so I came down from Seattle to go there. My wife, Christine, and I, we live in an intergenerational community in Seattle. Um, we've got three guys in their 30s downstairs. We've got a father with a teenage daughter upstairs. We have a meal a week. Uh, we garden once a month. We grow about 30% of our veg on an urban lot, so that's part of what we're doing. But anyway, I went to this conference, and I'd heard of social enterprise, but I didn't have a clue. This was all new to me. I'm not a business guy. And I, it sent me reeling because the potential for change is so remarkable in ways that I'd never thought of before. Churches don't think about this stuff. So I came back, and part of what my wife and I do every Sunday morning before we go to church is we journal what God's doing in our lives and share it before we go to church. So I went to this restaurant in Seattle called Portage Bay Cafe, and their big thing is local sustainable food. You know that whole thing. And I looked up from the menu at the waitstaff, black T-shirts, and the... The t-shirts all read, eat like you give a damn. <laughs> and that's where I stole for the title of the book. But truly, uh, it's, it's probably not going to show up in a lot of Christian bookstores. You know, I don't see that as swearing using God's name in vain. I'm just saying um, part of what I've done is to try to help the church wake up to how the future's changing. It's called strategic foresight forecasting. Every church does long-range planning, but very few of them do forecasting first. So we tend to operate like it'll always be the 90s. So I'm, I'm going to try to wake up the fact that I think we need to change not only in how we work for change like social enterprise, but in our lives and churches, because the kinds of things we're doing now aren't going to be very sustainable very far into the future. The church is in trouble. And, and that's even churches that have a lot of folks and doing good stuff. So I'm going to sound a bit of a wake-up call. Um, so I, I'm, so I'm, I'm trying to find a way forward in my own life. I came back from that conference, and, and 
that woke me up. And so I realized I need to get out of the bleachers because I've been writing about getting the church to do stuff. But I haven't been doing anything in decades. So I finally found somebody that let me volunteer called Lake City uh, Future First. It's just short distance from my home, intercultural community. So I'm now a volunteer. I don't know whether we're going to do social enterprise, what we're going to do, but these are good people with a good heart, good mind, including Christian folks. So I'm a beginner in this, so just to make that clear. Um, and I'm grateful for what you guys are doing because, like I said, there's not another conference like this I know of. Now, the title that Randy gave me is The Power of Experimentation. And I want to talk about this power, again, not just in terms of change making through social enterprise, but how to reimagine, reinvent our churches and our lives. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some risks, and I, uh, we'll have a little Q&A when I'm, you know, and I wanna, want you guys to feel free to do pushback. So uh, as I work with churches, and I've worked with a lot of churches over the years, my wife's from Australia, you know Mercy Ships? Have you heard of Mercy Ships? She's the doctor that put that together and ran it 12 years before we, we were married. And so we're both concerned and trying to find ways to do stuff. Okay, how many in the room are under 40? Under 35? Well, you guys are God's gift to this time. I hinted at this before, but because millennial generation, 18 to 35-year-olds, are the first digital generation, they're much more aware of issues of economic justice, racial justice, environmental justice, and the even better news is that you guys want to do something about it. So you're at the front of the change-making celebration. You're the ones that want to use your life. So I think, I think the Spirit of God is spurring up a generation, largely outside the church, largely outside the church, to remind people in the church about compassion, creativity, and action. And we have to change the church because the bad news is that the millennial generation is not going to connect to a church where 85 to 95 percent of the time and money never leaves the building. That kind of church doesn't have a future. And I'm not sure our churches are going to be able to change. I think we've got maybe a decade, decade and a half to turn the ship around. So we have to kind of reimagine. And so I'll talk about that. So I'm going to talk about change making, discipleship making, and church making in that order. And so uh, just out of curiosity, why did you come to this session? Before I go any further, find out what I plan, plan to say, see if it connects. Because the name of the book. The name of the book. <laughs> okay, well, we accept that. Yeah, it's just about getting serious. It's not about being profane. Anybody else? Yes? Well, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning on coming to this one until you spoke earlier, and, and we kind of fit into that, uh, into that, that that, uh, that age group where we're the next generation um, in the next 10 years, 10, 15 years, I want to just agree on, on how to be part of that. Well, it's so important, and can I just say another bit that I'm so concerned about for your generation, um, and this is again where churches and professors and colleges don't always pay attention, your generation is getting slammed economically. We have a whole generation of young people who want to make a difference. The highest schooling cost ever in terms of relationship to the job that works you through. And as you launch the highest housing costs, in San Francisco now, people who are college grads are, four years ago they were renting closets to sleep in. Now they've got like a dorm room with a bunk bed and somebody said 700 a month in San Francisco. Uh, it's a really hard time to get started. And that's one of the reasons we need to reimagine more than how to work for change. We need to reimagine how to help people get started. Anybody else? Expectations? Way in the back. Uh, I'm an accounting instructor, professor at Fresno Pacific, and I'm looking for ways for my business students to get involved in some kind of entrepreneurial activity there. Looking for Wonderful. Ideas. 
Wonderful. Uh, Seattle Pacific University has a competition every April in the School of Business to do what uh, you guys are doing here. So there are places like that. And you have? Experimentation. Experimentation. A lot of people don't take the risk of failure, and so they don't encourage experimentation. Mm -hmm. No, they don't encourage experimentation, and I want to encourage experimentation in discipleship and church making too. So I want to get us to think, and let me just say right off, um, just I'm going to say things a little provocative and feel free to push back. I don't think tithe stewardship is New Testament. I understand the origins, but I think following Jesus is a whole life deal. And uh, so many people, as soon as they give their 10% or some portion thereof, they're off the hook. And what they do with the rest is their own blank business. Oh, you understand what I'm talking? Yes, sir. So you just said on what intrigues me is how do you get people to get out and move in our world with good? Or for a difference. I mean, maybe, sure. I mean, because there's a lot of good that isn't even necessarily spiritually tied. Sure. So how do you bring all that together? Because that to me is how you can show Jesus in. in well, and. When I was converted, I was converted into a very privatized evangelical faith that sees the change making just in terms of what God wants to do in my heart and life. And I'm convinced as I get older, if you read the Bible and read the prophets and read Isaiah and read the Gospels, this is a God who really cares about communities being changed, lives being changed, not just spiritually, but in terms of what we're doing at this conference. Our God wants to see justice come, uh, and, and uh, it's societal change as well as personal change. Well, let me just jump in then and get, get through this really quickly. Let me talk about the change-making that I find encouraging um, in terms of what we're talking about in terms of free enterprise. One of the models I discovered first after I went to this conference was a guy named Sam who was a Peace Corps worker in Benin, Africa. He was working there and a family he was very close to had a house fire because the kerosene lamp tipped over and the son of the family was badly burned. So Sam was able to get a medical care and he started to get rehabilitated. Sam wound up nearby here going to Stanford getting an MBA, met a guy that was pursuing engineering and together, they created a new social enterprise project called D-L-I-T-E, D-Light. They created a solar lamp that's virtually indestructible. You leave it out in the sunshine all day, you've got four hours of light at night. It's cheaper than the kerosene lamp. It doesn't pollute, it doesn't start house fires. You can sell it door to door so people make an income. And so in areas in India where there's no rural electrification, this is scaled up in 10 years, believe it or not, to 10 million households now have this product. And that's one of the things that impressed me at the SOCAMP conference, that's every September, by the way, in San Francisco, is the, some of these things can be scaled up to touch thousands of lives. More recently in Nigeria, a young man who'd worked in Silicon Valley, not far from here, uh, from Nigeria, was a student there. He went back and developed an online banking service where there was no banking for most of the people in Nigeria. They literally carry their money with them. And this is accessible to the poor nationwide. So do you, I wanted to talk about scale first. Do you understand? So it's, it, the, the possibilities are remarkable. Uh, Katie Metzger is one of our staff in our little ministry called Mustard Seed Associates, but on the side, out of going to a program like this, she started a social enterprise in Thailand called Same Thread. Same Thread is, comes from the region in Thailand where women get drawn into you know, the whole sl slave tra traffic situation because they can't find employment. So she's employing groups of these women to make fabrics using natural dyes, and she's developed a whole clothing line, same thread that's being marketed online, you can Google it, in the Seattle area, and paying these women a living wage so they don't have to go any other direction. That's example two. And um, the third one, 
I'm trying to find my notes. Where am I? There we go. Um, in terms of what you saw on the screen, do you remember uh, Innove? The woman that won first place the first year in 2013 is named Leah. And her concern in the Twin Cities area, there's what they call a food desert. Almost 300,000 people in the Twin Cities area have no access to grocery stores or fresh produce. Nothing. So she won first place by saying, I want to start a mobile market. She's now purchased two old municipal buses and turned them into grocery stores, serving a huge range of people, and it provides uh, uh, access to something that didn't exist, and it's productive again. Capiche, comprende, sir, you understand? This is important stuff. And so let me just stop right there. Do those kinds of examples begin to help you see the, the scale and, and the potential impact? Are you starting to see? Because this was new to me. How many of you are business people here? Well, you business people, this probably makes more sense to you. I, I just, I didn't have background. Well, let me, let me go from there and let me just get into the sensitive area of um, our own personal discipleship, discipleship making. Um, one of the things I, as I work as a futurist, and I've been working with denominational leaders since the early 80s, and I showed mainline denominational leaders back in the early 80s that they were starting to tilt, starting to gray and decline. And it was like working with a group of alcoholics. Well, we see the lines, but you know, it's not any big deal. Well, if you are connected to mainline denominations, every time they have a national conference now, uh, they're hemorrhaging. And what do we cut next so we can protect the pastor's pension fund? So dramatic decline in availability of money and time to do any kind of change making. Um, but what is most concerning Evangelical churches are on that line, too, starting grand decline. Not many young people in the building. <clears throat> but the most concerning thing that nobody's writing much about is the declining levels of participation. For many churches, regular church attendance is once or twice a month. I can remember when it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Some of you are older, remember those days. Per capita giving in our churches, there's a group that researches this, it's been declining since 1968. It was about 3.8 in 1968, it's 2.4% and declining. Time to volunteer to be involved in any kind of change making is declining, okay? So my concern for the healthy churches is how long can you have declining participation levels of followers of Jesus without ripping the bottom out of the boat in terms of vitality? Do you understand the concern? So we need some kind of discipleship training that helps people up their game. One of the things that I found as I research social entrepreneurship and business entrepreneurship, you business people, you've heard about a life coaching? Have you heard about life coaching? It's like training athletes. And it feels to me like many of our churches have kind of become chaplain to the dominant culture, helping us limp through our week and try to get the bills paid and the kids off to school, but not really upping our game as followers of Jesus. Do you understand? And so I'm, I'm really concerned. I think we can learn from the life coaching people because they help people actually set goals for their life, develop, develop disciplines to free up their time and money for what matters most. Have you heard of a guy in San Francisco, Mark Scandrett? Mark Scandrett has written a book, uh, he and his wife Lisa, called Free, Using Your Time and Money for What Matters Most. I'm gonna put that out on the table if I can pull it out quickly here. And somehow we need to help people, as a part of discipleship, reimagine and reinvent time styles and lifestyles. Uh, not to just live simply, but to have time to be present to God and present to neighbor. And so we have to help people up their game if we're going to be involved in the kind of change making this conference is about. And 
a lot of what's going on in entrepreneurship comes out of Silicon Valley. Have you heard of design thinking? It's part of that whole thing that's a process. And I think following Jesus can be a design opportunity, a design opportunity. I'm talking about designing new kinds of housing and architecture. One of the things that happened as a consequence of um, the recession is middle-class white folks started living in intergenerational housing again. I think the invention after World War II that I grew up with of the suburbs with age-segregated living where the old folks were put in the containers and the young couples moved to the suburbs was a really bad idea. And the suburbs also became very, very white and very privileged and all of those kind of class and race differences. And we need to live intergenerationally, interculturally. We need, and that's the reason we're living in a shared household. It reduces costs for everybody in the household and it increases community. I think we're headed for some volatile times. I'm not into the end time stuff at all. But I think because of a lot of things going on in the global economy in the Middle East, uh, we need to find ways to be more supportive of one another as we follow Jesus. But part of that is to design new ways of being. And here's the thing. I think we can throw better parties. I think we can have better celebrations. I think we can take more time, as many of my Hispanic friends, to be present in relationships than many of us white folks are, you know? I think we've got a lot of our values messed up. And let me, as long as I'm getting into trouble, let me just say, I want to say to evangelicals who tell me that everything they do, they do under the Lordship of Jesus, I'm not sure that's true. Evangelicals bring scripture to bear on spiritual values, moral values, relationships, all important. My mainline friends bring scripture to bear on social, racial, economic justice, all important. What very few people are doing of any Christian persuasion is bring scripture, scripture to bear on cultural values, particularly our notion of what is good life and better future. Our notion of what is good life and better future defines where our time and money goes. It defines what we raise kids for. And so we're raising a lot of kids for economic success and servanthood and compassion is often not a part of upper middle class white privileged Christian neighbor. You know what I'm talking about? And if we can redefine the good life and shorthand, I think following Jesus, the good life of God is not found in seeking life, the American dream. It's found in losing life and service to God and others. And I think we can create new kinds of housing, new kinds of feasting, new kinds of celebration, drawing on the richness of all the cultures present in this room, the immigrant cultures that are here. So in order to see the church continue and flourish, I think we need to uh, be very creative in terms of creating new ways to follow Jesus and help one another. We all need support, I sure do. Now let me just mess with church making for a while. There's a huge amount of church planning going on all over this country right now. I'm not a church planner, but I'm learning about it. All of the denominations, old line denominations, are planning like crazy to try to head off further erosion. Going to be a lot of empty church buildings that are going to need to be repurposed. That's a resource. Um, but we need to create different churches. And here's, here's my radical proposal, and then we'll open up for conversation. Um, Those of you in the room that are under 35 are the answer for the church. But a lot of church leaders aren't smart enough to know you're the answer. Corporations are routinely sitting down with millennials now and saying, you're a creative group. You've got wonderful imagination. You're innovators. We need your help in product design. We need your help in product marketing. I've yet to find a church where church leaders ever sit down with the young people who are still in the building and ask them for their ideas. I'm talking high school age, too. Do you know, understand what I'm talking about? Ask them for their ideas. And then even more radical, like Innovate that we saw on the screen earlier, um, 
ask young people in our communities that are not believers, they're not affiliated with the church, but many of them care deeply about their neighborhoods and communities, sit down with them and ask them for their ideas. And then like Innovay, you know, they're working with anybody under 35 that's got a good idea. And those ideas are the best, they help them launch. And you have to know that if you take young people seriously in the building and in the community, you not only listen to their ideas, but you help them implement their best ideas. That is the secret sauce. Because when we take our young people and their ideas seriously, then it becomes their church and their community too. It shows respect. It shows valuing. And everybody wants the young people to hang around the building. But we need to start getting not only pastors, but leaders to sit down like you're doing this seminar and say, what are your ideas? The story from Innova, and then I'm going to open it up and have you talk around your tables, is Mike won last year, 2015. His concern were Somali refugees. 90,000 Somali refugees in the Twin Cities area is the largest population outside of Somalia. But the women don't speak see. They don't speak English. They have no job skills. So what would you do with that if you're starting a social enterprise? I'll tell you what Mike did. He found one of their food items that's unique to Somalian culture. I think it's called a samosa. It's a meat-filled pastry. He developed a market for it in the Twin Cities area. People like it. People are buying it. And he's hiring these women at a living wage to make something they grew up knowing how to make at home. Isn't that creative? Isn't that brilliant? Think of the number of lives that are impacted. And Mike is getting supported. Colonial Church is coming along with mentors and business people. What if your church could start to move in the direction of increasing how much time and money leaves the building so that it starts to reach 20%? I, there's a church, New Life Torrance in Torrance, California, 35%. There are a few churches that are approaching 50%, but um, the, I just wrote an article for British Magazine, and the question is, does the church have a Gen Next future? And I'm talking in all of our Western countries, it doesn't. The Pew Research shows that over 35% of millennials are not going to affiliate, even when they get married with kids. The only way I can see back is what we're talking about in this room and inviting the ideas and the creativity, creativity of Gen X, showing respect, helping them launch, and create churches that are churches for others instead of just churches for people under the tent. Well, I think I've messed around enough. Around your tables, uh, what is stirring out of what I've said? And feel free to disagree. I'm just an outsider here, and this is a little terrifying. And, but I want you to talk to one another first. <laughs> You say living wages, so obviously you're talking about Minnesota and you're, you've been from there. What, what is living wage? How do you engage with that as a Well, that's tough. It's a national debate right now, as you probably know. Seattle, it's gone up to $15 an hour. And California, I know that it's being discussed here as well. Yeah, oh, it passed, yeah. And so I think that's a question. I'm saying as we start social enterprises, we need to be sure as we're helping people, that we're not marginalizing them by paying them, you know, eight or nine dollars an hour, even though it helps them. And that's all I'm saying. But talk around the table, because I'm talking about the p potential of social enterprises conferences about, and how to reimagine how to do that. But how to reimagine to be followers of Jesus, and how to reimagine to be the church in times like these. So talk to one another, and then we'll open it up in a few minutes. I just discovered I wasn't clear enough. I'm asking you to talk about not only how to create new ways to do social enterprise, but how to reinvent and do new ways of being a disciple of Jesus so you've got some time and money to be involved in social enterprise and get your churches to change so that young people will start affiliating again with a church that gives a damn about their neighborhood. Okay, can we talk to one another? Excuse the interruption. Um,
questions or pushback, please feel free to disagree, to challenge, but I'd also like to hear your creativity. What are your creative ideas? Yeah, sorry. Oh, no. Well, I couldn't hear your voice. I, I was close. We were still engaged in the topic from before, and I was listening to this gentleman's uh, dilemma of having a 24,000 square foot warehouse, which the church body wants to convert into a worship center, if I heard correctly, whereas his wish would be to convert it into a microfinance opportunity. Uh, a microfinance opportunity, so business opportunity. Is it possible to do both? Yeah, because, you know, the church building is very poor use of space. It sits idle. We can't build many more of those, you know. Uh, and I just, church in our area, they built a huge Sunday school thing. And God bless them, they did it without going into debt. But that building sits idle except two hours on Sunday morning. Okay. Other questions? Things to do with discipleship, things to do with changing your church, changing discipleship, changing church. We'll give you one more chance. This is it. <laughs> Sorry. So I did have a uh, follow-up question for you directly about the discipleship, because as a 40-year-old person, I feel like I'm somewhere in the middle of the old school versus the new school, and I, yeah. I'm lucky enough to have a young man next to me who's kind of educating me. But you know, with even my own kids, technology plays such a role, and I view that as a deterrent to communication and discipleship and conversation. Are, are these the tools to disciple with in the future? Should I change my thought process on that? I am so glad I'm not a parent these days because I wouldn't know what to do with the handhelds. But God bless you. You've got to get control of those. A lot of parents will not let them take them to bed. They won't let them use them during mealtime. Some restricted to certain hours during the day. But let me talk about the kind of imagination of social enterprise. In my book, I discovered that the United Nations actually started a game that seven-year-olds can play just like games on the thing, that teaches them how to be urban planners. And believe it or not, elementary school kids get good enough at this to do serious urban planning. So the technologies can be reimagined to do good stuff. Yes, sir, please. Um, you know, interesting how our society moved away from the vocational schools. Yep. And that is an avenue I think the church can step into, and I want to get your opinion. I mean, sure. vocational schools would be discipleship, right? I mean, sure. You could do discipleship on the spiritual side and vocational discipleship. Sure. What experience do you have in that area? Well, I worked at Maui Community College, as I think I mentioned, and so it had people that were pre-going for a liberal arts degree and the shop programs. And there's a real strong need for that. Germany, as a country, does a better job of giving young people options because not everybody needs to go to college. And the cost these days is huge. When I went to a small Christian college back in the dark ages, we had dinosaurs on campus, you know. It was 1958. Uh, it was 700 a year for Christian college education, 700 a year. Room board, tuition fees, and books. I worked as a janitor in San Francisco, and, and I could pay that off during the, my summer job. The summer job has increased fivefold. The educational costs have gone up almost 50 times for what I experienced. So it's, it's daunting. And so we need to find some other educational options. Let me go to discipleship. Did any of you come up with ideas of how to help people become more serious about discipleship so we can stop the hemorrhaging of less and less time to be present to God, present to neighbor? You know, the church thing is becoming very peripheral, partly because of the screen time. Yes. So two things. Um, Germany, I agree, vocational schools are great, yes. but making sure that um, people still get their GED is important because in the German system I could never go to university because of the system it was set up. Um, so it's an important part that people still have an opportunity then later on to decide to go to college. But I think for me as far as discipleship, I grow the most when I'm challenged. 
And I think if we can get the churches to understand, if they get their folks outside of the church to serve and to engage with the community, the disciples will grow. Because I'm going to check back in the scriptures on how to answer the issue of abuse or how to answer the issue of addiction. So. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for the clarification, because I'm not an authority on education in Germany, but I know their vocational program pays good wages for jobs that you don't get waiting tables. But, but in terms of the discipleship, uh, one of the new church planning movements called the V3 movement, and there's a church in Syracuse, New York, called Axiom. And what they're doing, I'm not hearing any evangelical churches doing, they're helping people develop a rule of life and a rhythm of life. The rule of life, how do they connect their purpose, their life, to the change-making purposes of God? Because so many evangelicals are just a balancing act. Where do we use our time and money this week? If we can find a sense of calling, you heard of the book Purpose Driven? Um, my wife and I wrote a book that came out three months before that called Living on Purpose that I found out is still available on Amazon. Um, and, but we have not been afflicted with 52 million sales, okay? But our approach was everybody's called, not just pastors and missionaries. All evangelicals believe that, don't we? The problem is there are virtually no discernment processes to find our calling, discern our calling. So we offer a simple little discernment process, listening through Scripture, listening through prayer, listening through the needs of others we're talking about here, and listening through our own giftedness and brokenness. Some people are working with people with addiction issues because they've been there. And then crafting a calling statement that is specific enough that either through our leisure time or our work time, we're doing something to intentionally work for God's purposes. I know it's about that time. And, and I, I figured that out. I, I'm not as slow as I look. Yeah. And so, uh, and help people then to create a way of life that is focused around calling and vocation. And that helps you decide where your time and money goes, which includes time for change making, but time to be present to God, present community, present to neighbor. Let me say one closing prayer. Thank you guys for the engagement. It's really scary to be back in Fresno with people that are doing so many important things. And so thank you for the gift of this time. And by the way, my little book is designed as a study book for churches to help people talk about all three areas of change making. Creator God, this is a dawning time that we live in. I thank you for this room full of good people that are so engaged in this topic, we can hardly talk to one another. That's wonderful. God bless everyone in this room as we seek to see something of your kingdom come and your will be done through the resurrected name of Christ. Amen.